Welcome to the Tudor Dixon podcast. I have Dave Rubin with me. He is the host of the Rubin Report. Catch him live every weekday at 11 a.m. Eastern on Rumble, YouTube, and Locals. Welcome, Dave, to the Tudor Dixon podcast. Tudor, it's good to see you. Thank you for mentioning the time because uh, perhaps the thing I'm most proud about in my entire career is that I go live against The View every day. And I feel that <laughs> there are there are basically two types of people in the world, people that watch The View and people that watch my show. So, And then these two people should never meet anymore. It didn't no. have to be that way, but that's where we're at. That's actually, I mean, just before we, we started to talk, we were talking about those those people, the contrast. And I was saying to you that this is actually the first time I've actually seen the signs be completely destroyed. But you see on like our Facebook informed pages where people say, oh, the Kamala signs were stolen, the Trump signs were stolen. I came out of my neighborhood today, brand new, fresh Trump signs put up. I went home at lunch and they're all slashed and cut apart. This is the most emotional I've ever seen people in an election season. It's really bananas. You know, I have the luxury now of living in Florida and, you know, I lived in crazy California before that, where things were obviously very different. I fled here during COVID and, I, and I'm very proud to live in a red state. I'm a first time registered Republican since I moved here to Florida. Um, and obviously I don't see a lot of, you know, Kamala walls signs. However, there is one in my neighborhood and I walk my dog every day and we walk by the sign. It's one of the few neighbors that I've actually never met. I'm not even sure if anyone lives in the home. But it's like if that if that person walked out the door and, and I try to be friendly to all my neighbors, I think it's I think it's actually a really important thing in an age of living on our phones to know your neighbors and say hi to people. Uh, I think that actually helps tie things together when things get a little crazy, like a pandemic, let's say. But if that person walked out and we started chatting like, it's so hard for me to get in the mind of what a, a Kamala Harris, Harris, Tim Wall supporter is, that it would be a very, very difficult conversation. I would have a lot of preconceived notions that probably are true and that I wouldn't be thrilled with. And they probably wouldn't be that thrilled with me. But it shouldn't be that way, obviously, in America. But yes, it is kind of where we're at. You know, it's interesting, though, I did have this conversation with these Harris Walls women a few weeks ago when we went to a Fox event and they were they went there and I could see where they were coming from. When you sat down and actually talked, there was some pain in their life stories that connected to issues that they felt were going to be attacked by Republicans. And you could see where they I mean, you can actually see where people are coming from, but the core issues we felt the same about. And they didn't realize, not that I converted them in any way because I didn't, but they didn't realize that this Democrat party has become like a true war machine. And I look at this, I how do you not realize that? They're literally out there campaigning with Liz Cheney and touting <laughs> Dick Cheney's endorsement. Right. Well, the fact that they've now embraced the Cheneys, I mean, Liz Cheney, a woman who lost her primary in Wyoming by 60 points, who's liked basically by nobody except MSNBC, because she's sort of, you know, a pet Republican that, that basically runs with Democrats. And then Dick Cheney, a man that they called Darth Vader, who they thought was was actually worse than George W. Bush. I mean, they thought he was the devil, but they thought, you know, Dick Cheney basically was the Palpatine behind Darth Vader in that case. Um, the fact that that is what their coalition is a little nuts. But to give the devil his due, and you can probably speak to this and, and interact with more of these women than I do, to give the devil his due, what I, what I have found with some of the, the women, let's say, that are the Harris Walls supporters, is that the abortion seems to be the main issue. Now, there's an irony there, of course, because my body, my choice, except these are the same people who wanted people to be forced with vaccinations that were not even vaccinations. But let's put all of that aside. What I've tried to explain when I have whatever interactions I can have with some of these ladies is that I may have a different feeling on abortion. I, I consider myself begrudgingly pro-choice. I think probably 12 weeks is the best way to do it, but I fully understand the ethical implications on both sides, and I'm happy to discuss that further if you want. But what the real issue here is that abortion should not be at the top of your hierarchy of importance when you're looking at what you should vote for. So if you really care about women, I think you can make a very clear argument that actually you should care about the border more than anything else, because the border is where crime is coming from and drugs are coming from. And we know that rapes are going up and murders are going up. And yes, they happen to women. So mm -hmm. and of course, it happens to men, too. But if you really wanted safe streets for your daughters and your mothers and grandmothers, 
you would care about the border. We, we could do this with a lot of other issues, but somehow the Democrats, the machine, the culture has just lodged abortion as the thing that they should vote on more than anything else. And, and that's a very, very tough one for Republicans to get over, even though in a bizarre sense, Donald Trump it's not that he's he's obviously not pro-choice. He put in justices that reversed Roe v. Wade, which kicked it back to the states. He's not for an abortion ban. But you, it's very obvious that abortion is not one of his top issues in in the reality of his mind. It's something that he's he's played politics with, I think, rather effectively because Roe v. Wade should have been uh, should have been reversed. But lodge, dislodging that from from a lot of women is just very very difficult, and uh, well, I, I don't know how we do it. I know. I think that they played abortion very well in 22. And I think that Republicans had no idea what they were walking into. I'll be honest with you. Abortion was not a story in my life. I never thought about it. I I wasn't an, an anti-abortion activist when I ran for office. It just, I didn't even, I, naively, I had no idea how many people have abortions just for choice. You know, I did not realize that this was something that people were so married to. And I don't even know that it was as much until it became like this chant from the, the left. You know, it became like, you have to be on board with this. And so I don't think that Republicans were ready to deal with it. But it's funny you bring this up because literally before I walked into this room to do this podcast, my phone rang and I generally do not pick up numbers that I don't know. And I was like, eh, Washington, D.C., maybe it's somebody that I know. And it was the New York Times. I'm like, oh, of course, this would be the time I answer. <laughs> and she and who knows what she'll write. But she was like, you know, I'm just wondering, the Democrats in Michigan are playing ab the abortion card really hard, but it doesn't seem like it's working as well as it was. Do you think it's going to? It's, it's decided here. I mean, and it's up to the moment of birth. I mean, there's no limits right. on abortion in the state and it's in the state constitution. It's never changing. It's not going to work on the state level. They're trying to like attach the, some federal candidates to it. But Trump has already made to your point that very clear. But I think it 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 indicates to me they don't have a plan. And that's your point is what else right. are you looking at? Well, that's the thing. Trump has repeatedly said in debates, in interviews, et cetera, he is not for a national abortion ban. And it's not just that he's saying it. The reason, the whole purpose of reversing Roe v. Wade was to kick it back to the states and let the states have their laboratory democracy. And unfortunately, where you live, obviously in Michigan, is very different than where I live. By the way, as a Floridian, I mean, I just said I, I'm for, let's say, 12 weeks, I think would make sense. And again, we can argue the ethics of that if you want. We have six weeks here. I happen to disagree with DeSantis on that. However, I put abortion, you know, if I have my top 10 issues that I'm thinking about when I'm voting, for me, let's say abortion's eight, right? Something like that. It's certainly not in the top three where I would put, you know, the border and the economy and, you know, safe streets and get drugs off our streets and homelessness and things of that nature. Everyone has to decide what that order is. But the beauty of America is that you can make a decision for yourself. And if you don't like what's going on in Michigan, you can go to Florida. And if you don't like what's going on in Florida, you can move to Michigan. The issue seems to be that as far as the demographics go, lots of people are leaving blue, state, uh, blue states and nobody's uh, leaving red states. So there is a sh massive mm. shift, which I think our founders would be proud of. I mean, it's the proof that federalism actually works. It's and just unfortunate matter. that the Democrats <laughs> lie about so much of this stuff. Yeah. I mean, taxes matter at the end of the yeah. day. But to your point, eventually, when you're overtaxed, you leave the blue state and people start to go to the red states. And I think that that is truly a reality that we've seen in Michigan. I mean, there the population has continued, continued to decrease. We we have this conversation going on right now and it's a national conversation. So I want to get your take on it is like we're in this housing crisis. We have a terrible housing crisis. Whitmer has in Michigan said she's putting a billion and a half dollars into the state building houses and refurbing houses. Kamala Harris has come out and said that she is going to give people money to buy houses and build houses. But the number of houses that we have per, per person, we really aren't in a housing crisis. We're in a cost of housing crisis. So right. how does the government building more houses help us with the fact that housing is too expensive? 
I mean, but this is why they're confused about all issues, right? First, briefly on the taxes, and then we'll do housing. The fact is that you guys in Michigan have an, a state income tax. We don't in Florida. Mm-hmm. Yet we still have roads. We still have police. We have probably better public schools than you do for the most part. Our, our public schools suddenly are bizarrely great, largely because of DeSantis getting all the woke stuff out. So it's not about how much government takes in. It's about what government does effectively with that money. And unfortunately, California, New York, Michigan, some of these places just don't do that stuff particularly well. As for housing, it's like, what does the government have to do with building housing? Houses. Is this Russia in 1971? Right. Like, what are we talking about? If you want people to come in and innovate and build houses more cheaply and everything else, what you do is lower. What you do is lower taxes. You'd lower regulation. You get more competition going. You'd also make sure that you have all of the economic conditions set so that people want to come to your state. So I'm in Miami uh, right now. I'm in the suburbs of Miami. We are knocking down houses left, right, and center. There were seven infrastructure projects that when DeSantis was sworn in the first time had 21 year runs on them. So they were gonna be seven massive infrastructure projects related to uh, housing and related to urban development and roads and all this stuff that were gonna be 21 year projects. He moved seven of those projects to seven years because he was like, holy cow, there's so many people coming here. Hmm. That's what government is supposed to do. Make sure the roads work and you can connect areas and things like that. The government should not be building housing. That's what home builders should do. Uh, You know, basically go anywhere that you would want to live. And the places you want to live are are interesting and unique. They're not the cookie cutter things that governments can come up with. We all we all know this instinctually anywhere that you go that's beautiful versus, you know, like some sort of linoleum place that, you know, the government built that looks that literally looks like a Soviet building from 1970. So get the government out of most of these things. It's not that complex. But for some reason, a lot of people just have some of this just lodged in their brain and can't get over it. Well, and I think that that's where you a lot of young people are enticed by this because you hear, well, I'm going to I'm going to need a down payment. I'll get a down payment if I go with Kamala Harris. This is all very it's hard to connect until you've worked for a while that, oh gosh, that's all going to come back to haunt me. That's all, it's going to raise all of the prices. We're going to have all of this inflation. This is a real problem. And so you see them making these promises, but I don't see anything when it comes to keeping us safe. And I want to go to the border because I've been talking to people in Michigan about that. I'm like, look, you tell me that you're most concerned about issues related to women. It's women who are being raped. It's women who are right. being killed. The open border, it it affects women more, more so than the men. But you also have men being trafficked, to your point. And you also have men who are, be, are having drug overdoses. This is, to me, outrageous. But you have a safety issue as well. I mean, Kamala Harris is like the originator. She's the, the original cheerleader for being able to go rob the the drugstore and not get in trouble for it. And we're running out of drugstores now in the United States. I literally just heard this on the news yesterday. They're like, now people can't get their pharmaceuticals because all of the pharmaceutical stores are closing. I'm like, cut, because they're all being robbed. That goes directly back to her championing this exact concept of you can rob up to $900 and then and, and you're good. It's it's all so insane that if you wrote a sci-fi book about this 50 years ago, people wouldn't believe it. The I, This $900 thing that they have in Los Angeles means that you can walk into Best Buy and you can steal a PlayStation 5 and four games. But if you take that fifth game, if you go for that extra Call of Duty, then they're somehow going to get you in trouble. And by the way, they still won't get you in trouble because the guy who's guarding right. the door is not going to do anything. Now, ironically, here in Florida, we have open shelves, right? You can walk into CVS or Walgreens or whatever and get your deodorant and get your uh, whatever, your toothbrush or anything else. And you have to pay for it. And virtually nobody steals here. You know why they don't steal? Well, A, there's a culture that that doesn't lend itself to that. That's number one. But we don't, we don't, in, we don't offer people just this blanket check to do whatever the hell you want to do at all times. If I was to walk into the mall and walk into Lululemon and steal a workout shirt, I might get shot, not only by the person who works at Lululemon, but just by some guy that has concealed carry that's in the mall. So an armed citizenship, people who take their rights seriously, you end up having to rely less on the state. And unfortunately, again, people in blue states, particularly big blue cities, have this completely, completely backwards. 
But I would also say that you can rely on law enforcement in your state, too, and they are not yeah. hindered oh, yeah. by the, the governor of the state. And you take look at look at Minnesota. I mean, that is a state where you cannot rely on law enforcement because you've got the governor who is running to be the vice president of the United States who will not empower police because they decide that police are not important. You've got Ilhan Omar coming out and saying we'd be in a much better position if we didn't have the police. They had their half of their city burned to the ground. I love the the meme out there right now where Walls is hitting on Donald Trump for going to McDonald's and they put post a picture of the burning McDonald's in Milwaukee. Yeah. And said, well, this is how he feels about it. You know, I mean, these Right. It's not even a joke. This stuff really happened and they're ripping on him. But they are the they are the reason that the United States is at risk in so many areas and why women really are at risk. They run an ad in Michigan that says one in six women will be raped. It's a pro-abortion ad. I look at that ad and I go, my gosh, what are we doing about that? Right. Right. Deal deal with the reasons women are getting raped. And let, we don't have to pretend that all the rapists obviously are illegals. Obviously, they're not. We have all sorts of mental health problems right. and, and a gajillion other things that we can think about and discuss and the cultural reasons for that and all of those things. Except, but that's the point. What they want to whittle you down to as a woman is basically just thinking about abortion. They want to whittle everybody down either either to their genitals or some other immutable characteristic and then scare the hell out of you as it pertains to that thing. And and it's a really dangerous philosophy and I think you can connect it to the Dick Cheney, Liz Cheney, Democrat thing. Because if you look what's happening on the right right now, you've got Trump, who's just the head of, a, I would say, a very wide tent that now includes ex-Democrats like Robert F. Kennedy, who literally a year ago was a Democrat, or Tulsi Gabbard, who ran as a Democrat for president only four years ago, and a whole bunch of other people. And there's this wide tent, hey, we love America, we can agree to disagree, fine. On the left now, you have this thing where it's like, we don't know what allies us together other than power. So right. you have the anti-war people with the most pro-war people, and they're somehow saying we're going to be in cahoots together. You have the open borders people with the people that purport to be the feminists. And it's like, well, I don't know, you might have some jihadists wandering in who are going to rape some of these women. None of it makes sense, but it's propped up by a media that still can keep people in a constant state of confusion. I find it fascinating that they have taken the they've gone all in on celebrity, all in on elites. They've b brought out all of the elites. You saw Obama shaming black men, saying you yeah. need to go out and vote. They've gone to that extreme. You've got Donald Trump meeting with the families of the victims of, of illegal alien crime, these women who have been murdered. He's sitting down with their families. You see him doing the barber shops. You see him working at McDonald's. I mean, it's a total... The, these two campaigns could not be more different. And I think in the past, the celebrities have been very effective. Now, what we're seeing on the ground is there are people who are reporting in Michigan that they don't see the numbers of early votes they thought they would see in Ann Arbor, where the University of Michigan is, in Lansing, where Michigan State is, and they're getting a little bit concerned about that. I just wonder if they've overplayed their celebrity hand, because I feel like, from my perspective, entertainment is one of the best things that we have in the United States. We, we make the greatest movies. We make the greatest TV shows. We are good at this. But if I look back at what happened when football became political a few years ago, really hurt football. And I just yeah. wonder if this is hurting them because people are like, I don't want the person who's entertaining me to be political. No, they, they, this is why wokeness destroys everything. I'm, I'm not a huge football fan, but I'm a huge basketball fan. And I don't watch the NBA anymore because during BLM and during COVID, they went so hysterical on talking about racism constantly and by extension ESPN while covering that stuff and then demanding you get injected with stuff and all, all of it. So it was race, it was COVID, it was the whole thing. It was like, I watch basketball and I play basketball to have fun and enjoy myself and work out and all that stuff. But they've turned it into the thing that you're supposed, the thing that's supposed to be escapist has now become the most polarizing thing possible. So I think you're right. In essence, they they did something. It was clever at first. It was like, oh, let, we win culture. That's what the left is really good at. So how do you win culture? Get the athletes behind us, get the actors and the comedians or whatever. And then at some point, it just kind of ate itself. And I think we're at that point now. And that, by the way, is why Barstool Sports is more successful than ESPN at this point, mm. because Barstool started focusing on sports and being funny and irreverent. And ESPN was telling you that men are women and that, you know, you should 
burn down uh, Pep Boys in the name of social justice. Right. I, I think that that has I have not seen them come around the transgender movement with the Kamala campaign. So I think that's interesting. They haven't really pushed this whole. Wait, you're not for tax funded uh, sex changes for criminals <laughs> in yeah, jail yeah, now she's... or illegals? Come on. But yeah, think bigot. about think about that. I mean, this to me, to me, it is scary because you have someone who goes into prison for some sort of crime. They have a victim. The state is going to pay to change their face and put them back out on the streets. I've never I could never imagine this is like that movie Face Off where the criminal <laughs> changes his face and then you can't recognize him so he can go hurt you again. I mean, what? Everybody's like, well, why would we pay for it? I'm like, why would we give this person a second chance at harming other people without knowing who he is? Well, Twitter, in their defense, I don't know if you watched Orange is the New Black on Netflix, but if a dude thinks he's going to get it any easier in a women's prison, those chicks can be rather intense. <laughs> valid point, valid point. Okay, so I want to I want to go to Faith as well, because this has been very, well, just in general, the, the Harris campaign, it's funny to watch how they try to correct after the fact and they act like they're not but they are so she she goes after you first you see gretchen whitmer with the dorito and everybody freaks out and they're like oh my gosh our democrats do they hate catholics and then you see kamala avoid the al smith dinner and again they're like uh what are you doing to catholics and then i think it's the next day at her rally someone says jesus is lord and she's like out you're at the wrong place go to the other yeah. rally and everybody's like wait a minute, do they actually hate the First Amendment? Are they going to take away our religious freedom as well? And then she shows up at the Baptist church and everybody prays on her, lays hands on her and prays. There's so much there. You know, my good friend Sage Steele has been traveling with President Trump at these rallies and she, we played it on my show this morning. She gave a wonderful speech at the beginning of the rally, I think yesterday, talking about how everyone is welcome here. You're welcome here if you're a Christian. You're welcome here if you're a Jew yeah. or a Muslim or an atheist. But it's not because you are that. It's because the idea in America is, yes, you can be a Christian or a Jew or an atheist. You can be gay or straight or male or woman or whatever. But that there is something about freedom that brings us all together and the, the beautiful documents that this country was founded uh, under that, that takes those things and puts them into the tabla rasa that makes all of us better together, right? It sounds corny, but that really was the idea of the melting pot. What, the, what they have done is basically be like, well, we don't really like Christians because Christians are white. We don't really like white people because they're on the bottom of the intersectional thing. And Jews, well, you're kind of white adjacent and you're successful. That's a problem for us. So Jews are out. Uh, Muslims, you're thought of as brown. So we're going to move you up the thing. Blacks, well, some of you are successful from Senegal, first generation. That doesn't really make sense. Like it, it, none of it makes any sense. None of it makes any sense. So I, look, I don't think they have any, as a general rule, this is a little bit blanket, as a general rule, I don't think they have any belief other than in the system. I think that's what they, I think Kamala Harris believes in the system. I don't know if she believes in God or not. I, I don't care whether Doug Emhoff proclaims to be Jewish or not, or any of these things. These people believe, Barack Obama believes in the system. And that's what they are trying to keep going. And Kamala is a particularly nefarious version of it because she has to live in service to that system because look what the system did for her. Right. She was polling at zero in her own party. They pluck her, make her the VP because of her skin color and her gender. That's what Joe Biden said himself, not me. Then they, they basically force him out and the system then says, you will be the heir apparent. You think she's going to live in service to that system or what? So I don't know who she prays to, but I know it's not God. Right. Well, I love how also she's incredibly gross with the things that she says, this weird laughter, how she gets mm -hmm. out of control. She kind of slurs her words. She she does. She doesn't answer questions. But the most recent one that I found to be really bizarre was when she was like, even Jimmy Carter is staying alive. <laughs> to to vote and i'm like oh my gosh they literally dragged this man out on his deathbed or his death wheelchair because he is i mean i give him credit i don't know how he has stayed in hospice as long as he has and i and i think there actually may be something to the fact that he has stayed alive to vote because i think that there are things that keep you alive and he and roslyn were like so close that i thought for sure it would be days apart but it, after we saw first of all 
if that is ever me, I will kill anybody who takes yeah. me out and puts a picture of me like that out. Well, right. This so is to our put him out president. there. If, if, yeah, I don't know. Maybe your guys in post can throw the image in if you want people to see it. It's it's deeply disturbing that image. Mm-hmm. And that's it, like trying to joke aside, like he looks like the crypt keeper. He clearly is not consciously aware of anything. And, and how long that has been, we don't know. It almost seems criminal that they would even put even let him be photographed, much less claim that his last desire was to vote for Kamala Harris. Like it, it sounds so fraudulent, <laughs> but that's not even that that's not even what the real issue is. The real issue is what you said. It was the glibness where she's like, if Jimmy Carter can get out there, because basically what she was saying was, if a lifeless carcass can be wheeled out there and vote, then you can too. <laughs> and it's, so like, it's like, what? It would have been different if he was doddering and old. If Joe Biden can vote for me, you can too. Joe Biden's a little confused. He, you know, it gets to 5 p.m. He's sundown, doesn't know where he is. That would have been sort of funny. If Joe Biden can figure it out, you can. Not the man who looks right. like death on a plate. If he were slowly hammering on his Habitat for Humanity house. But right. no, right. this is a totally different situation. Yeah. Oh, my exactly. gosh. I know. I know. And that's where it's like. What are these? These people are unreal. It is that to me is when you see this is all about power. This is not about love. This is not a movement of joy. This is not a movement of coming together. This is a weird power grab. And and I mean, she is a grabbing power. She came from nowhere. She didn't receive a vote. She just jumped in and was like, now it's me. And everybody's like, oh my gosh, this is truly an episode of Veep come to life. Okay. Before I let you go. This I that we've seen now with Bill Maher and all these guys who are like, you know, I think that actually they're a little bit uh, concerned with speech and free speech. And, you know, he had this segment where he talked about Elon being kicked out of doing the the launches because they said he's he I mean, they openly said we're not going to let him do an, yeah. it here because he's he has weighed in on this presidential election. And Bill Maher's like, like, this is America. And yet you still have Joe Scarborough and uh, what's his name? Mark Cuban, Cuban. Mark Cuban. Yeah. Who are like, yeah, but what? Yeah. Look, this has become the, the thing that is wrong with the modern liberal mind, because when you when you say I am only in this for power, you're going to do a whole bunch of crazy things and you're going to reverse every position and everything else. You know, I'm always Bill has become a friend of mine and I've we've done each other's shows and had dinner and all that stuff. So I put that I'm just mentioning that to say when I'm critical of him, I like him as a human being. And Bill is an old school liberal that actually, if we were to reverse 30 years ago, most Americans Americans basically, and if they, they may not know it, but most Americans in their own life behave as classical liberals, where you want some level of limited government, you're for free speech, you think the country's kind of good, and then we can argue on the margins about, you know, welfare state and some other stuff. But the, the liberal of 30 years ago did not want open borders. The liberal of 30 years ago did not want eight-month abortions, and we can go down the line on these things. So Bill is in a weird spot because he's a not insane liberal in an insane party. And because he does have Trump derangement syndrome, which I've said to him publicly and privately, he'll never get there on Trump, but at least he say, at least he, what he's saying is true. The other guys, it's like Joe Scarborough should, should be in a cave somewhere and never be seen again. Joe Scarborough, a week after the, the debate that Biden got demolished, Joe Scarborough was out there saying that he's sharper than I am, literally sharper than Joe himself. Like, and that, that actually might be true. But like these people, they (laughs) lie about everything. Cuban is another one. It's like, dude, you were a moderate, well-liked owner of the Dallas Mavericks on Shark Tank. And now now you're running around pretending DEI is good. Dude, how many how many white five foot four women did you put on the Mavericks? Come on. You know, it's not real. You know, it's not good. But I, I don't know. Is he hedging his bets? I don't know what the deal is with him. I I, yeah, I cannot even I think that he actually is jealous. He's one of those guys that would love to run for president. And he's trying to, like, work his way up to yeah, that. It like, might be. This is what I this could be me. I don't know. I watch this. I watch. The you might view. be right. It might just it might just be like he's looking at Elon. Elon's a billionaire. He's a billionaire. He's like those people like that billionaire more than me. I'm going to put on my thick rim glasses and pretend I know what I'm saying. 
Yeah, and it, I mean, I do think that people look at Trump and Musk together and they, they go, oh, gosh, we could be that. And we don't want this to be just them. We want to be able to step into that. I think it's it's bizarre. I think the behavior on The View is b- bizarre that I've seen these days. But I we're, we're right there. We're right at the edge. I, I told you when we started this that I was with some Trump folks last week and I said to them, are, are you comfortable? And they're like, we're watching this just like everybody else. I mean, we're watching these polls. And one day you feel like we're winning this. And the next day you're like, man, it's really tight. It's really tight. But if everything goes as we've seen in the past, I mean, I feel good that Donald Trump could run away with it. Look, I I hope you're right. But also, I definitely don't have to tell you this because you lived through it yourself, that we were told we were getting a red wave two years ago and that, that, you know, a couple governorships were going to flip, including you. And I seriously wish that would have happened, not only because I I like you as a human, but Michigan, Gretchen Whitmer is one of the worst people in public office in America. I mean, she is she is not maybe not the devil like Newsom's actually the devil, but they're somewhat related. Let's put it that way. And I and clearly has not been good for Michigan. Um, so we thought it was going to happen last time. It didn't. And by the way, it didn't in large part because of abortion. They freaked women out about abortion right before you sort of referenced that earlier. So to me, it's like anyone pretending that, oh, we know what's going to happen right now. No, you have no freaking idea. I think every data point that I can look at culturally and in terms of the numbers and everything else and, and what we're seeing, the amount of people who have left the Democrat party, um, you just don't see a massive movement of Republicans suddenly becoming Democrats. Yeah, there's like these Lincoln party, asexual weirdos, but you don't see like a huge movement of people that we just mentioned between RFK and Tulsi, this this actual, the Elon thing, this cultural movement of San Francisco billionaires and tech people all suddenly Plus to the backdrop of COVID where people realized clearly red states were run better and everything else. So there's so much evidence, I think, and and cultural data points to point to that that Trump should win in a landslide, like a like a Mondale, you know, Reagan Mondale 84 landslide, 49 states. But I mean, if we woke up the next morning and they were like Kamala won, like you gotta give the devil his due. Right. I propaganda is strong. It it is definitely split right down the middle. I will end this by saying I was sitting with a father uh, probably six months ago. He is uh I think of Indian descent out of California, and he said his his niece, even though top of her class was the best candidate for one of the Ivy Leagues, he said she couldn't get in. She applied as a transgender. Immediately she was admitted. And he said that was the moment that we realized like we're being discriminated against. And I think once you feel it yourself, when you feel that discrimination against yourself, you're like, this is not the country that I thought it was. So we will see. I I agree. It's right now it's up in the air. We have no idea what's going to happen. We're all kind of like, oh gosh, let's just get through this. So we shall see. And afterward, I'll, I'd love to have you back to talk about it. Tudor, anytime. And, and, you know, you're always welcome here in Florida. I know it's getting a little dicey in Michigan. And Whit- <laughs> Whitmer's probably got you on lockdown right now. You don't even know what she's probably surveilling you and God knows. Like that woman, I, I just like you probably really have things you don't want to say publicly about her. I despise her. I mean, I think she is so profoundly evil. And it's like, lady, ease up on the Botox, if nothing else. You know, I think that like, she is truly a useful idiot. I think she, f- oh, she fills oh, out the Oh, I think she's defin- worse than an idiot. You're being she's, nice. She is, but she really does. I mean, how does she allow social media people to let her do such stupid things? I used to think it was that she was evil, but then I really thought maybe she's just not with it because why would she go out and she's doing shots at the bar the other night? I'm like, I know that that might go over well with the college kid but the mom who's got a diaper in one hand and spit up all over her chest and she's trying to get the baby to sleep is looking at that and going my days of having a shot at the bar are done right now i'm trying to feed this kid it's it's just like how do you get to that point where you're like i'm just gonna be i'm the cool mom i feel like it's just mean girls every day it it absolutely is and michigan certainly deserves better and as you said we shall see Oh, we shall see. Dave Rubin, thank you so much for joining me on the Tudor Dixon podcast. And thank you all for joining us on the Tudor Dixon podcast for this podcast and others. Go to TudorDixonPodcast.com or check out the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And join us next time. Have a blessed day.